So thank you for being here. I'm glad we were able to order up some nice weather for our guests who came up from Washington this morning. Uh, the, uh, the, for those of you that are streaming in, uh, I want to welcome you and just let you know, yes, in fact, you are in the right place. This is, this is GC698. This is the speaker series. And we have a really special guest today. Uh, Dr. Maria Frieri is the President and Executive Director of the Foundation for the National Institute of Health. Uh, we had a few minutes to chat and uh, I discovered uh, that uh, one, of, uh, one of our colleagues here was actually funded uh, by Dr. Frieri's group. Uh, I think, was it 2015? So, so um, we're, I'm, I'm sort of hoping that he saw this and, and is showing up uh, so that we, we maybe can have some dialogue about uh, what that experience is like. So um, uh, let, me just, uh, let me just bring up our guest who has just pretty interesting stories to tell us about the genesis of her own career and the genesis of this organization and the, the pretty cool and amazing things that they do. Please welcome Dr. Maria Frieri. Thank you so very much. I'm not sure I want to talk a lot about my career, but I'm happy to do so if anybody's absolutely um, interested in it. It has been a torturous path. Um, but the good news, when you have careers like mine, I was uh, my, my, un, my graduate degree is in biophysics. I did two postdocs in virology and immunology. And for those of you who are cognizant of the sciences, I will tell you a couple of brilliant career moves I did in my life. The first one was that I decided that there was going to be absolutely no future in RNA and DNA. And so I devoted my career to membrane biophysics, which um, you know was my first clever move. And then the second move was uh, in well three clever moves. The second one was immunology. Uh, my first postdoc was in immunology, and I can tell you I had no idea what things meant. The only redeeming feature of that was that nobody else did either. So I'm very glad and very happy that we're now using immunology to do some fantastic things in immunotherapy. And the third decision was, of course, that there was going to be no future in retroviruses, meaning AIDS. So I decided that I was going to focus on herpes viruses were the thing at the time. So given those wonderful decisions made in my um, prescient scientific career, I decided that I probably needed to change a uh, way of moving forward. And I decided to go to Capitol Hill as a fellow, a AAAS fellow. And that was quite an eye-opening experience. And one of the things I worked on while I was on the Hill was the Bayh-Dole Act. Raise your hands, who, of those of you who know what the Bayh-Dole Act is, which basically allows federal funding, uh, universities and groups that get federal funding, to patent and license their inventions, which you couldn't really do before. So leaving Capitol Hill, I went to work for the University of Maryland. And um, somewhere in between, they were recruiting my husband, who's now at Hopkins, to, to leave. And they said, what would you like? And uh, I said, well, I'd like to do technology transfer. And they said, do you know anything about technology transfer? I said, I have no idea. Do you know anything about patents? I don't know anything about patents. But it was so early in the game that I was given this amazing opportunity. And who knew that several years later, I actually got the by Dole. Uh, award. So there you are. This is how life happens. Um, I was went to NIH for a bit. Um, I learned a lot. I was there during the genome. I met Francis that way. He was. Uh, I got a call two weeks into my job, and somebody said, uh, "You have a phone call." And so I got on the phone, and they they said, "Hi, Maria. Yes, this is Francis Collins. Oh, hi, Francis. How are you? This is 1995." And he said, uh, "Harold Varmus tells me that you can help me with patenting of genes." Okay, then <laughs> let's move on. And that started that amazing ride. For those of you who may have been aware of what happened with the whole human genome um, uh, revolution, which has marked our lives for the better so many, many times. So became the head of, the, uh, of a little organization that was funded to develop drugs for uh, 
very important disease, but that had no market. It's a disease of the poor. It's tuberculosis. And I'm very proud to say that we now have one of the drugs that I first licensed into the TB Alliance is in a new drug application of the FDA. So we will have a new drug for tuberculosis, which is one of the things I'm proudest in my life. I went to head the Lasker Foundation. For those of you who know about the Lasker Awards, they are very prestigious awards. And my, I was minding my own business when I got a call and said, how would you like to head the foundation for the NIH? And I said, hmm, what's the foundation for the NIH? And so I'm going to tell you all about it today, because it is a very well-kept secret, but it's really an amazing, amazing organization. So if we can, um, what do I do about starting the video? Do I just go like this and against that, or where? Good. Thank you. The next great discovery will be The next great discovery will be shared by the minds that bring it to light. By the organizations that can each see a part of the future. By people coming together in new ways. to create a new possibility for health from the spark of imagination. To collaborate on innovative biomedical science and research. Collaboration for innovation. FNIH. Good, so the reason for the video, other than I think it's really cool, is because it has you notice it's a three-strand helix. It's not a double-stranded helix, but it has, a three it has three prongs, and that is because it's meant to represent the private sector, the public sector, and the, the, um, the uh, patients in the community. So here we are. I'm going to talk about the foundation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do in terms of uh, our numbers and statistics, our role. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about one of our partnerships. And finally, I want to talk about the lessons learned. So if anybody has a pressing question, please raise your hands. I like to make this um, quite fluid and conversational. But here we go. If I learn how to do this, there we are. Oh. You can read that perfectly, I can see. So let me tell you, let me tell you what it says. Um, what is our mission? Our mission in a nutshell is to support the mission of the National Institutes of Health. Now, we were created by Congress because in the late 1980s, there was a revolution happening in biomedical research and in biology. But the Congress understood and realized, and this was very interesting of them, that there were restrictions. Give it, if you're a federal employee or if you're in the federal government, there are certain things you can do, and they're very powerful and very important, policy being one of them. But there's certainly other things you cannot do, like you can ask, not ask for money. So when the whole biotech revolution was happening, it became very clear that there was a space here in which you needed a catalyst between the federal government and the private sector and the academic sector to make things happen. And so we have the wonderful system of grants and peer reviews, and we have the system of funding by companies, but there was no space in between. So Congress created the foundation for NIH to sit in this space. And our role and our mission is to support the agency. We're not the only ones, by the way. There's a foundation for the Center for Disease uh, Controls and Prevention. There's a foundation for the FDA. There's a foundation for, for DOD. And we, um, I get called to Congress, I've done this already twice, to set up other foundations. So there was a foundation for agriculture that just got formed. And we're in the process of thinking through uh, a foundation for the Department of Energy. So Congress, and indeed the companies, have seen that inhabiting in this space, that this central catalytic space, is important for innovation. It's important for getting things done. 
One of the, um, I'm going to show you who my board is. Uh, it's a fairly large board. I have 27 board members. I don't know that you'll recognize uh, or that you can even read the names, but I'll, I'll point to a couple. Um, we have a, a big variety of people represented on the board. We have people that are philanthropists. We have people that are scientists. We have people that are uh, federal, ex-federal employees. Uh, for example, Elias Serhuni is a member of our board who used to be the head of the, of the NIH. We have people like Joel Marcus, who's the CEO of Alexandria Real Estate. We have um, Frida Lewis Hall from Pfizer. And so this group is composed of a number of people. And that, in fact, makes our job um, much more interesting because they bring different perspectives to, to the table. Now, here's what I'm talking about, the numbers. How big are we? We're, we're about, in two years, we will be 25 years old. We've brought in a billion dollars. Now, those of you who know how much money the NIH brings, the NIH brings $37 billion a year, the majority of which go to institutions like this one. So our little organization has only brought in $1 billion. But here's the thing. It's $1 billion that is not restricted the way the money the federal government brings is restricted. So our money is flexible, and we're nimble, and we can use it to do things that traditional grants and contracts from a government cannot do. We're independent. We have our own board. And so when we get requests from the NIH to do something, we're at liberty to say, no, that's not a program that we want to embark on. Uh, and we've done it as a matter of fact. So we have to make sure, and I'll talk about this later, that the things we embark on, we're small. We're 60 people strong. We're, we're, we're small but mighty. We need to make sure that we don't spread ourselves too thin. Now, we have to raise money. We don't get, we get half a million dollars from the NIH by statute, and everything else we bring to the table, we raise. So we do a lot of fundraising, and a, the majority of our fundraising is project-based. So 91 cents of every dollar that anybody gives us goes out to people like the, the scientists that, that we funded here. Um, we've had about over 600 projects that we've done since the beginning of the foundation. Currently, we have 124 projects, and I'll talk about them in a second. And um, we have the top rating from Charity Navigator, which is one of these watchdogs, uh, for now 15 years. So we, we, we get very good grades, I'm very pleased to tell you. So our business lines, what, what kind of things do we do? So the first thing, of course, is we raise funds and support programs at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we also have a very big footprint in science and global health. And in fact, the, the person that got funded here from us came out of that group of grants. And we do biomedical partnerships. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the biomedical partnerships in a minute. But let me just show you the pie chart for our portfolio. The, the, the blue. Um, part of this pie chart, which is by, large, by and large the majority of it, 69% of our portfolio, is in fact we fund research. We fund research pro projects and we're completely agnostic as to who gets the, the, the money except for one thing. They have to be the best. If you're the best in the field and we've brought you to the table because we think you can bring something to the table, you will get our funding. We can fund internationally, we can fund locally, we can fund universities, we can fund CROs. We have enormous degrees of freedom to get our projects done. Um, that red sliver is capital projects. I'm going to talk to you, just mention it in a second. And the green, which is the second largest, is um, about 20% of our portfolio is education. We fund the MRSP program. We have uh, folks that come to the NIH during summer internships, et cetera. So we raise the funds and, and we fund them. Uh, the 
124 projects that we're funding right now are at a cost of about $380 million. So that's the lift. We've had to raise $380 million to get these um, projects, ac programs accomplished. And as you can see, we have about 14 of the NIH institutes represented. So a lot of our money is funneled and focused through the projects that, that they care about. And, and in this visual, um, I don't know if you can see it, but this, um, that little, this, these are my capital projects, and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. The, the one furthest to your right is the Safra Lodge. I don't know if anybody here knows that there is a hospital on the NIH campus. Anybody know about the clinical center? All right, so the NIH has a, a hospital. In order for you to be treated in this hospital, you have to be part of a protocol. I mean, there are folks back there that know about IRBs and all that good things. So you have to be part of a protocol. You can't walk in and be treated at the NIH. The thing is that you don't pay for anything while you're there. Your treatment is free because you are truly a part, an integral part of the research protocol. And most of these people have really no hope. This is their last hope. They come to the NIH because this is a place where they will get unique treatments. So we created, with the help of Lily Safra, who is a member of our board, a lodge on the NIH campus. And the families and the people who are there being treated at NIH can go to this lodge, it's quite beautiful actually, and stay there for the time, the three or four days that people are at the NIH. So it's a wonderful thing to have happen. Um, the little, the, the, <laughs> the, the picture on the left of that is our, um, Christmas gingerbread houses, which we support, and believe it or not, groups from all over the clinical center, including patients, bring together, we give them the kits to do the, the, the gingerbread houses at, at uh, Christmas time, and they decorate them, and they start, has anybody seen a Christmas, uh, you know, gingerbread house thing? They're this big. Well, you have no idea. They're the size of, of half of this room sometimes. They've put, they start it with this thing and they put everything out. So it's fun because you get to do these things that are important for patients and um, are important for the community. We also bring quite a large amount of donations, clinical, clinical drug donation program. Companies donate the drug for these clinical trials. So a lot of partnerships, very well-known partnerships, clinical trials like LungMap, we're doing something right now, PACT is uh, immunotherapy. So it, it really does cross the gamut of enormous um, partnerships. But why do we do things in partnership? First of all, because when we started, we were, I think they had about six people and half a million dollars, and you can't do very much unless you do that. And the chairman of the board at that time was Charlie Sanders, who was the head of GlaxoSmithKline. And Charlie figured out that the only way that this organization would be able to move forward is to do partnerships by leveraging uh, talent, money, resources, science from other groups. So we've now become very good at creating these partnerships. Um, and when we do them, there are certain things that we look for, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But for those of you who are in the biomedical field, you know and understand how complex biology and medicine is today. You can't do it alone. You need artificial intelligence, you need data uh, gurus, you need nanotechnology, you need biotechnology, you need basic biology, the underpinning, underpinnings of uh, disease. And so bringing all of these multidisciplinary and cross-disciplinary groups together has made it possible for us to lift uh, in, in ways that are much bigger, much bigger than we would be by doing it alone. And these partnerships are created not only for research purposes, but they're also created for development of new drugs. The tuberculosis organization that I mentioned earlier, for example, 
we had no labs. When I started, we were three people, literally. So we had to bring in the, the drug, license, license the drugs in, figure out who could support us, find out who could do the clinical trials and the preclinical trials for us. So this notion of complexity of bringing different partnerships does work for, for many, many kinds of operations. But um, it does take time. And people have been known to say that these partnerships, particularly these mega partnerships that, I'm, uh, that we work on, are not for the faint of heart. They really are very, very hard work. So what does FNIH do in this space? We don't do anything in this space. There we are. Yeah. So um, the first thing that we do, and, and I'm going to illustrate it later uh, on AMP, is we figure out and we work on projects. We like working on projects that are going to provide a change in the field. If it's something that will um, be one more of the same, we don't have the bandwidth to do that. If there's something that others are positioned to do better, we don't need to be in that space. So when we look at where we can actually have an impact, we need, we look for very, very specific projects in which we will be value added. So we work on, as I said, common diseases for the NIH and uh, some things that are core to, to the NIH agenda. We focus on the pre-competitive space. We do clinical trials course, but by then all the IP and all the drug and uh, information is owned by either companies or private foundations, sometimes by the government, but not many times. But our, our real sweet spot is in the pre-competitive space, and by that I mean from the very early stage of knowing what the problem is, knowing where the, where the biology starts, all the way to going before we put something into humans. So we bring the people together, we sit them around the table, and we de define a comprehensive project that will move that needle forward. So I'm going to talk to you um, about today. I'm going to give you one example mm -hmm. of one of these partnerships, and it's called the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, which we launched in 2014. It is a partnership with NIH, FDA, 12 life sciences companies and non-for-profit companies. And this is in three, in four areas of, um, of medicine. Alzheimer's disease, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune disorders, particularly um, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, and we just launched Parkinson's disease. And this is just a pictorial representation of the groups and the people that are involved in, in each one of these. So for example, if you take type 2 diabetic with diabetes, which is the second pillar there, we have groups like Jensen, Merck, Liller, Lilly, Pfizer, and, and Sanofi involved. We have the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation involved. We have the American Association uh, American Diabetes Association involved, the NIH itself, et cetera. So all of these people sit around the table for all these different indications, and they determine what is it about that indication that is lacking and where we need to intervene. So here we are. Let me tell you how the AMP program development process happened. It took about a year. It wasn't uh, that simple. But it starts right here on, on the left-hand side with an initial concept. And we bring together around the table the people and the players that we think are going to be critical. We created an executive committee. We have this concept. It's going to be a 50-50 partnership between the public sector and the private sector. And we're going, the, the idea is that all the data that gets produced, it's going to be put in the public domain very quickly and very promptly so that everybody could access it. So the idea here is what can we do that will lift all boats? The initial research started with a white paper. 
And the white paper was, again, the product of this group of people that decided what we needed to do for Alzheimer's or for, or for um, diabetes or for uh, rheumatoid arthritis and, and uh, recently now for Parkinson's disease. We go out after we have this brilliant idea and we say, all right, who's in? Who's going to fund this? Because I have to tell you, we have had fantastic ideas where at the end of the day, nobody wanted to fund. So if we can't bring the money to the table, the project dies. And it happens. Uh, luckily, we go through a triage period that um, minimizes the number of times this happens, but it does, it does happen. Anyhow, so throughout this whole process, we've been fundraising. We now have the right people. We now know who is going to put money on the table. NIH is also good at, going to put grants. That's that line over there with the dollar signs. That's NIH saying, all right, we're going to put R01s. We're going to put a call for and request for proposals in this area that are going to match what we're doing with the private sector resources. So you have the federal funding. You have the private sector funding, which includes foundations. And then together now, you have the size of program and the amount of money that you need to move this forward. We go through a research plan that's very, very detailed. We have milestones, we have deliverables, and then we sign the, fin we sign the funding agreements. And it all leads to that black box, which is uh, the Accelerating Medicines Partnership. This all happens, this all happens before you start embarking in the science. So you've created this partnership. You've half the buy-in of the people that are going to be sitting around the table. You have the funders and you put it. And then you launch the phase two of the program, which is the implementation phase, in which we are at this moment. And everything that is part of that then becomes, you know, it gets, gets published, gets moved forward. And in the case of um, uh, RA Lupus, we've just, uh, the executive committee decided that the results were so exciting that they wanted to continue it and enhance it. And that's happening as we speak right now. So good, important, difficult work that gets done because a community comes together and wants to answer that question that will provide the inflection point for science and medicine to move forward. I'd like to spend the final five minutes talking about the, the lessons that we have learned in doing this. We've been doing this now for 20 years. And there are certain things that we've realized are part and parcel of how these things become successful. So um, OK, there we are. In this final slide, I wanted to share with you that the most important thing is what's down there in red. And it's at the end of the day, this is about people and trust. If you don't have the right people around the table, and if those people don't trust each other, these partnerships won't work. And so we spend an enormous amount of time making sure that we get buy-in by, from each and every one that is involved in these partnerships. If you have people that don't trust each other, they will not put their data on the table. They will not make their drug or their intellectual property available to others because they don't trust what's going to happen with it. So ensuring that you have the trust and that you've built a community and a group that all know where they're heading and they all understand the importance of what they're doing is absolutely critical to get this done. But there are six other uh, important lessons for us. The num number one lesson when I say this, non-scientists just roll their eyes. But the truth is science rules. You can't put enough money behind a project that is scientifically flawed. It doesn't work. The science has to be good. It has to be solid. You can do course corrections. And sometimes it doesn't work. And at that time, you have to have the nimbleness to be able to say, it's not going to work, and we are going to walk away. 
The second is, I mentioned it earlier, we must be value added. If somebody else can do it better, they can do it faster, they can be, they can be more clever at it, we don't need to work in that space. That space is better taken care of by other people. But when we embark on something, we embark on it because we will make a difference. Even if the answer is no, we will have made a difference. When you get these people around the table, you have to be able to articulate the goals. Now, here's one of the lessons that we have learned. Definitions matter. Definitions matter. Any of you here who have kids know that you will say one thing and they will understand something else. Well, that happens with everybody around the table. What, what is a success for some doesn't begin to match the definition of success for another. So we spend an enormous amount of time making sure that we all understand what success looks like and what we want to get at the end of the day. And that seems pretty obvious and logical, but I'm telling you, success for a pharmaceutical company is very different than success for a trade organization is very different from success for a patient advocacy group. And so understanding the different perspectives and the need for all these groups and determining realistic um, endpoints and expectations, it's critically important. So the final point, I've spoken about science, the value added, articulating common goals, being open and precise in commitments and being able to walk away, being able to walk away. And we now go to um, the importance of governance. Governance of these mammoth alliances, and we're talking $300 million, $200 million, I mean, these are big, is critically important because it allows you to deal with things like conflict of interest. It allows you to deal with bad actors. It allows you to deal with ensuring that everybody understands that you will publish and that it is important to get the publication going. So the governance structures have public uh, representatives. They have private rep representatives from the private foundation. We're involved in, in these governance um, structures to make sure, again, that the whole enterprise is solid and robust. And finally, it's the funding. Uh, I've spoken about the amount of time we spend doing our due diligence, the amount of time we spend going to potential funding sources. But here's the thing, you know, everybody, I mean, there's this saying which, um, <laughs> which is prevalent, and, and they say, you have to do more for less. That's nonsense. You can't do more for less. What you can do is be smarter and be more strategic on how you deploy your funds. So when you have a, 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 a mammoth alliance like this, and we have I don't know, $10 million less. You need to make decisions of what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. And if you have more, like in the case of RA Lupus, where you're going to put your money and your funding. So for us, um, get, making sure that we have sustainability from the financial perspective and the buy-in from all the players allows us to, to um, stand up these, these groups. So. Um, that's what I wanted to tell you we do. We do it quietly, but hopefully we do it in a way that's, that's good and impactful. So happy to, to take any questions. Yes. Please join me in thanking our guests. So we, we normally do a little Q&A following that's the presentation. Good. And um, since I have the, the microphone in my hand, I'm going to begin. Um, I noticed that when you talked about the four pillars, um, one of the pillars was Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if, you know, recently there were the big Wall Street Journal headlines about the collapse of a major the clinical trial. The Biogen trial. trial. Yeah, yeah, the Biogen trial. And so uh, they, you know, th I think they got to like phase two and said, this is going nowhere, we're out of this. So two questions. Um, were, were you approached to be a part of that and did you walk away because you found the science uncompelling? And now that, that people are saying things like, 
all right, we have to start all over again. Yeah. What, what would, if you were advising them, what would you tell them? Well, Biogen, if you look at, uh, at our, our Alzheimer's pillar, Biogen is the second company involved with that. We were absolutely not involved in their trials. That was a drug that was a Biogen drug. What we're looking uh, for here are potential new targets. This is a target validation for Alzheimer's. Um, we're all reeling from, from the Biogen um, stopping of the trial because of futility. For us, it isn't so much that we are um, worried about Biogen. Biogen can take care of itself very well, thank you very much. But what we're reeling from is that we thought this was a good target and that w there would be a dose response with uh, cognition and, and the drug. And so everybody now is going to be very, very nervous about investing and figuring out what we do with the amyloid plaques. So the answer is no, we were not involved. Um, I have not been approached by Biogen, although I know these people and they've been very good supporters of us. But this then becomes even more important because this is basic science and understanding the disease itself. One of the huge problems we have in Alzheimer's is we don't have a biological marker to tell you when something is working or not working. We thought amyloid plaque um, would be one of them. And so getting a better understanding of the basic biology is going to be critical. And this is why we feel emboldened um, in, in this pillar. Yeah. We have a question. We have two questions here. So uh, thank you. So already she asked my part of questions. So you mentioned here so many companies, like they already failed several times for bringing uh, innovative uh, their targets. So you are also saying you are developing target, specific targets. Yeah. So it's a huge conflict of interest will come with the company when they will come on the table because one drug for Alzheimer's disease make their company 100 billion high. Yeah. You know? So that's the demand of the world now. Yeah. So that's a critical step, I think, believe. believe. So whether uh, uh, are you people considering to bring a cost-effective way to bring, like university investigators? They are and there. They are so they're yeah. so doing good job, you yeah. know. Even uh, they are they are doing for non-profits, you know. So yeah. whether you can make a groups uh, using different uh, scientists, top grade scientists, and accelerate a program for bringing uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease in future, that will be more effective, I believe. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I com well, first of all, the conflict of interest we deal with uh, very quickly and very openly. We do not allow anybody to take a close look. The companies do not determine what, what uh, um, it, the science is going to be. This is all determined by the group. And I'm sorry, I, fr I neglected to make it clear that the monies we raise all go to universities. This research is all done at universities. So these are the members of the consortium and the people who, um, you know, are part of the of AMP. But all the research is done at universities, as a matter of fact. And I can give you a list of all of the, the universities that are part of these, um, of these, uh, uh, groups. For example, in the case of diabetes, uh, we're looking for data. It's all done at the Broad Institute. So we have a number of, of uh, university relationships and the university faculty sit at the table here too. So I need to make that clear. That's a very good point. It's not made clear. So the money goes out both from the NIH, which funds the scientists, and from us that supports the grant. So many times what happens is and I, they will have an NIH grant for, let's say, looking at this, and we come in with additional money and say, all right, we're going to power your research by giving you more money to do this or that. So it's all, it's all done at the universities, so not done at companies. So let me introduce my colleague, Dr. Heather Rose, who uh, has a pressing question and has to leave before, <laughs> before yeah. too long. So, uh, and I'll come back to the other hands raised in just a moment. Yeah. Yeah, sorry I jumped in line in front of some people. You, you actually, honestly, to make it even worse, you kind of just answered my question. Um, so I was interested in you saying that you fund CROs. Um, and I was thinking, how does that work? But I'm thinking what happens is that somebody comes to you with a great target or story about a mechanism, and then they, don't, they either don't have the capabilities in-house to do the work, or they should outsource them for, to be most cautious. And you'll fund the work, and then the, but the ownership will still go back to the PI that 
that brought you the project? Yeah, uh, we fund CROs in the cases where we need to do some data analysis, for example, with massive clinical trials, right? Mm -hmm. So so this is, the, the, the faculty members are very happy to do that, by the way, because uh, we fund a lot of our clinical trials are done through the NIH um, clinical trial networks. So we fund the networks, and then a CRO has a very specific and small amount of work that needs to be done in a very specific area that needs to be, as you said, either propelled or, or enhanced. But the clinical trials that we do, we don't fund CROs massively. We do them for laser sharp uh, particular th uh, um, investigations that need to be done or analysis that need to be done where there's no other capability. But we do fund the, the large amount of the clinical trials, all the clinical trials that we have come to think of it, are done through the clinical trial networks that the NIH has, either the cancer clinical trial networks or the um, um, aging clinical trial networks. So that's how we work. Yeah. And we have another question here. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, this, uh, this is a general question, or at least we'll start as a general question. <coughs> Will you consider funding uh, <coughs> clinical trials for a software-based device that's related to some of the comorbidities that you mentioned in, in the Accelerating Medicine Partnership, but, but basically it, it, uh, it's a software-based device, so the kind of funding, the kind of money that you need for clinical trial doesn't even approach the kind of money that you need for, for medication, but, but still, you need money for that. Yeah. We have not done, um, I don't know what you mean by clinical trials based on um, s software, you said? Oh, yeah. 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 If it's part, so the way we fund, because that goes to this gentleman's question. The way we fund is we do not get proposals from the academic centers, right? We look for who's doing something in an area, and we will invite them to the table, or the NIH is funding them already, and we know that there's research going that way. So if we were to fund something, for example, on, on um, the kind of area that you're talking about or things we've done in M Health, it's because the proposal has come to us from NIH saying, we're funding this part, this innovation, NCATS, for example, will say, okay, I'm interested in funding this uh, in, in the, in, in, in the um, software space, or mental illness, which is going to become a whole new area of research in which um, software is critically important. We will definitely go into that area, but it's something, it's always something that in a, it's core to the NIH, and NIH needs the additional groups around the table. So the answer is yes, absolutely, why not? Hi, can you talk a little bit more about your fundraising, where the funds are coming from and yeah. distribution? Yeah, we, fun we have different kinds of fundraising. There's fundraising for projects, which is the majority of the money we bring. Those come from companies, they come from um, uh, organizations like the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, the Alzheimer's Association, private philanthropy, the Simons Foundation, the Gates Foundation, for example. Um, we also have individuals that donate to us. They will say, I'm writing you this check for support of cancer research. You know, many times they come because their mother, father themselves have been treated at the clinical center and they want to give back. And they say, okay, I, I would like to do this. And it's usually in honor of or designated for a particular purpose. We also have one fundraising a year for, um, in which we give out the Lurie Prize, which is a $100,000 award for um, a relatively young person in their fields. And so we raise a little bit of money from that. But by and large, the funds that we raise are raised from those groups. Private philanthropy, we have a lot of money from Bill Gates, as a matter of fact. Um, we have monies from the companies for very specific projects that they're interested in supporting and money from organizations like the Alzheimer's Organization uh, Association, et cetera. That's where it comes from. But we do get um, private funds. 
we never accept anonymous contributions from companies. We do not accept contributions from tobacco or industries that, you know, fall into this um, nebulous category. We do accept pr um, anonymous donations from individuals once we've sorted out that they will report that contribution to the IRS. We've had people wanting to send us money, but they were not going to uh, <laughs> contribute it. So we figured that wasn't a good thing for us. So we're very careful on, on how we bring in our funds. So yeah. Anyone else? And it's all on our annual report, by the way. So we well, disclose all of it. It's yeah. interesting. We have some mind reading going on, because uh, Heather's question was asked by someone else, and yeah. then this young lady's question was asked by this gentleman. So yeah. a, lot of, uh, a lot of interesting connectivity, Good. even within the audience. Good. Thank you so much for making Thank the you. trip and being part yeah. of our series. Yeah.